The most commonly asked question that I get from uh, bond and people who want to own bonds uh, is usually, what do I do with my high yield fund? Uh, and we all know that high yield funds in general are not yielding <laughs> that very high yield. Uh, most of them are in the oh three and a half percent range right now. Um, wh where, what is your thoughts on high yield right now? The, the, the general feeling for a lot of investors is still stay in there because the Federal Reserve is essentially ring fencing the economy and essentially particularly protecting uh, the, the high yield uh, companies uh, that are out there, those who have high yield uh, funds uh, and, and bonds um, from default. Uh, what's your view on high yield right now? Yeah, thanks, Bob. I think we've got to look at the fundamentals for high yield issuers are quite good. We have an economy that's reopening. We have very strong fiscal policy. We have very supportive monetary policy. That makes a good environment for corporate borrowers. The valuation, as you've cited, yields are low by historic standards. I think investors should be realistic about the expected return. Is that If it's in that neighborhood of 35 to 4%, I think that's the, the right place to center expectations. But given that, we do feel like the bonds are likely to produce that return over the near to intermediate term because, as you alluded to, there's really strong monetary policy that's going to be supportive. The Fed has made clear that until inflation is demonstrably above 2% for an extended period, like 12 months, and employment has neared full employment across many different subsectors of workers, the Fed is going to hold out from tightening a monetary policy. So compared to past periods, returns may not be as generous. There's good reason to believe that the returns embedded in a 3.5% yield will be earned over the near to intermediate term. Dave, weigh in on this. It's easy to argue, I don't want to own any treasuries. You can make an argument for owning, I suppose, corporate bonds, uh, intermediate term, uh, high grade corporate bonds. It, 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 is the risk reward at, say, three and a half percent yield for a high yield fund worth it at this point? I, you know, most of, most of the folks that I'm talking to are actually looking not to the bond market as any form of a yield vehicle because they just don't think they're getting paid enough. They're looking at it purely for that diversification angle. And so, you know, to John's point, looking at corporates, looking at high yields, staying that belly of the middle of the curve, that will give you some diversification. But most folks I'm talking to who are looking for yield are actually more likely to go into the equity market, either looking at high dividend yield or looking at any number of yield generating options that come to market that really use the options part of the equity market to throw off that yield. I, I think we have to think past that traditional 1640 portfolio and look to other sources of diversification and other sources of yield. It just seems really insane to me to be thinking about holding uh, a, a you know a 10 year asset that's paying off maybe a 3% yield in the current environment, it just doesn't seem like you're getting enough of a reward, not from a default risk standpoint, I'm with you there, just from a raw return perspective, when you can actually extract a few percent out of high dividend yields, it seems tricky to justify the move into high yield. Yeah, I mean, you're getting 1.7% on the S&P 500 right now. 3.5% seems like, uh, you know, uh, a pretty paltry uh, additional yield for for high yield, given the limited upside you get just owning high yield versus owning stocks. Uh, yeah, I, but I, I suppose there's very good... Three or four percent inflation, it seems very hard to justify owning many of these fixed income properties, honestly. Well, I think we might differ yeah. on that. Let me move on. Four percent inflation, that's really not... Go ahead. ...inflation we would be expecting. Um, not you know, long term, but I think for a couple quarters, I think that's not an unreasonable expectation. I think we might get some idiosyncratic three and a half percent here somewhere in the next, and I just don't think that that's going to bode well for the pricing on these bonds. I think yields are going to have to come up regardless of what the Fed's doing. Well, I think that three and a half percent is a transitory number that's pretty easily predictable given the year-over-year -year effects of the pandemic. So we'd expect trend inflation over the longer term to be moderating back down towards about two percent. Um, I think we will see a couple of quarters of high prints, but I, I'm something tells me that that's already pretty well factored into market valuation. Yeah, there's the, the debate. I mean, the transitory statement. Transitory is kind of like the magic pixie dust we, we, that the, the Fed has now been able to sprinkle over everything, saying, well, we might be 3 or 4% now, but it's not going to be at the end of the year. That's the source of the whole debate. Uh, John, I want to move on. You've got a new bond offering. This doesn't happen very often. Um, Vanguard's ultra-short bond ETF, VUSB, it launched a, a week ago. 
uh, I hear it just hit $100 million in assets under management a week after launching. That's, that's not bad. Vanguard doesn't launch a lot of new funds. So why was there need for a, an actively managed um, uh, short-term bond ETF? So we do feel this is a product that can really help investors uh, faced with zero money market yields. Uh, investors could move out to a fund like this with about a one-year maturity and earn a little more yield and have the ease and um, convenience of an ETF vehicle, which works really well in the ecosystem for many investors and many advisors. And from an active management perspective, Vanguard has a large uh, stable of actively managed funds. We've been doing it for a long time. We feel like we can generally add value to a portfolio like this for clients. Um, so we feel good about it. And we've had a similar fund in the market for about six years now that's done quite well for clients. And uh, so we're trying to, to expand the access to this type of product using an active ETF vehicle for Vanguard. Yeah, it's, it's a tough game, short-term you know, bond f funds, particularly when you're dealing with active management. Essentially, you're playing for a few basis points, right? I mean, what, we, what would be the expected differences between your actively managed fund and, say, an, an index short-term bond fund? Well, I think the difference is compared to the average fund that's out there would be the, the, the fund will have a very low fee at about 10 basis points. And our team, using their active strategies, we hope would add you know, 25 to 50 basis points a year. Um, and have had some success in doing that. So um, those would be the kind of advantages that we're thinking about. Yeah. That is a remarkable as aspect of, of Vanguard, uh, the ability to do active management at a really you know, low cost. Um, many of your funds are, 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 are much lower uh, than everybody else's. Um, some of the, uh, the bond funds are in the 20 basis point area, uh, where other people's are in the 40 basis point area. What, what's the sort of secret to keeping these active funds at such low costs? Well, Bob, the, the key to Vanguard's low cost for clients at its core is our mutual ownership structure, so that clients benefit by owning Vanguard, and we're not having to create a profit or a dividend for a third party. So that's the core of it, and we use that two ways. We provide the return for owning Vanguard to our clients, primarily in the form of lower fees, but the other thing we do is we make active choices about investing in our business. Do we return uh, to clients via lower fees, or do we invest in the business and produce greater capability and greater returns? And we try to strike the right balance there. And in our fixed income group in the past few years, we've invested a lot in our capabilities in things like emerging markets and high yield, global and mortgage-backed bonds, all in the name of raising capabilities. We've expanded a lot our capability as well to manage scale and complexity in our index franchise. So we feel like our clients are getting the best of both, the lower fee, but also wise reinvestment in the business and the capability. Yeah. Dave, Dave, let me move on and, and talk to you about the whole pricing of bonds in general. We know the ETF haters have been saying for years, oh, wait till things really get volatile. These ETFs, particularly these bond ETFs, are all going to blow up because they're not going to be able to trade the underlying bonds once things once there's a lot of redemptions out there. And all of that turned out to be a lot of uh, nonsense. Essentially, we had a lot of volatility last year uh, and bonds were able to price very efficiently. Uh, even in uh, more obscure corners. W what does this tell us about the nature of pricing and, 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 and ETFs, and what does it imply for, for uh, bonds and bonds ETFs? Well, you know, ETFs have served primarily as price discovery vehicles for the fixed income market. If we look back to the disconnects we started seeing in the last couple of weeks, March last year, uh, it is the case that we saw wild prices in the bond market, in individual securities, in ETFs. But consistently, the volume went through the ETF, and that's really what set what the market price was going to be for, say, high-yield bonds, for investment-grade bonds, for high-yield beauties even. Um, those, those securities, those ETFs, kept trading no matter what was going on in those underlines. And as those markets get more and more electronic, which is happening more every day, we're up to about two-thirds of Treasury trades clearing electronically, roughly a third of non-Treasury trades in the U.S. clearing electronically, that's up. 100% in two years, that actually makes market making much more easy, easy in these products. Uh, and so what we see is spreads keep coming in, even in those moments of disconnection, those, those really are transitory, to use the word of the day, um, disconnects between, say, the advertised price of an ETF and its underlying index. We're seeing that get better and better as time goes on. The market gets better and better at understanding it, and structure seems sound. 
You know, I'd like to just... yeah. John, isn't it something that the ETF tail kind of wags the dog at this point, uh, that, that we were able to effectively price not only ETFs, but even bonds um, uh, during times of very high volatility and when we had re- redemptions. Uh, this is, I take it, unabashedly good, what, what Dave is talking about, more electronic trading of bonds because it implies more pricing efficiency. Am I correct in assuming that? How, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I agree with Dave on, and I think to expand on the centrality of, uh, of ETFs in the bond market as a really important innovation that is dramatically changing and I think improving the liquidity of the bond market. If we think about what a bond ETF is, it takes hundreds or maybe thousands of individual bonds. Each on its own may have very low trading volume, but the ETF consolidates them into a standardized trading unit that trades on an exchange, all the transparency and benefits of that, and it concentrates the liquidity. So as Dave referenced, people who are looking to transfer risk, buying or selling bond market risk, can do it very efficiently. And what we find is that that sort of basket, that consolidation of number of securities into a single unit is becoming increasingly common and at the cutting edge of trading throughout the bond market. So active investors who may not at all be involved in managing ETFs are using basket or portfolio trades to modify their portfolio, move in and out of the market, and implement their strategy. And so it centers around the bond ETF innovation, but it's transforming the way bonds trade. And I think, importantly, increasing the liquidity of bonds overall. Yeah, I think it's wonderful because it's it's completely disproved the ETF haters who said the whole thing was going to blow up because we wouldn't be able to trade the underlying. And as it turns out, it's the pricing of the ETFs helps set the underlying pricing of the bonds. This is profoundly interesting to me from an intellectual point of view because it's somewhat uh, anti-intuitive, but it does work that way. (laughs) 